Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to New Books and Music, a podcast from the New Books Network. I'm your host, Gummo Clare, and today I'm speaking with Ross Cole, who's lecturer in popular music at the University of Leeds. We're going to be discussing his fascinating book, The Folk, Music, Modernity and the Political Imagination, which was published in 2021. Welcome to the show, Ross. Thanks very much for having me. Um, so I guess, first off, could you tell us a little bit about your academic or professional background and your path into scholarship? Sure. So I started off... Um actually researching Steve Reich um, in the 1960s music and the 60s really led me thinking about it more broadly to what else was going on and so I started thinking about the folk revival and the blues revival and decided to kind of pursue a PhD on um, a different topic to what I've been working on before and uh, yeah my thesis ended up again sort of taking that and, and broadening it out so I, I was sent back to the 1890s and um, you know onwards a little bit and so the book came out of that longer kind of uh, obsession of the 60s um, in terms of revivalism, but also then a, a kind of more sustained historical interest in the kind of materials that were being revived, so back to Cecil Sharp and back to the turn of the century, where you find, you know, interestingly, a lot of parallels with um, not only the 60s, but with today as well. Even because towards the end, you make those parallels explicit, but throughout, the, I, I found the process of reading it, it, that things immediately sprung up, that you could see the, the kind of continuities in the way that people relate to to past musics um and so in the introduction to the book you lay out your case for kind of looking again at this concept of the folk and how its use with regards to music can often feel kind of contradictory so being applied to both radical and reactionary ends but correct me if i'm wrong you're suggesting that actually despite this the preoccupation with folk and folk music which are two i guess slightly different things that you explore has a kind of coherence as part of a broader anti-enlightenment tradition could you unpack this a bit and explain how the concept or myth of a singular folk is both a critique and a product of industrial modernity that's a great question yeah um i mean the introduction is slightly more theoretical than the rest of the book um precisely to try and pin down that problem that we have the sense um that we've inherited from you know the mid to late 19th century that there exists this body of people who um, lived in a kind of yeah pre-modern state and, and enjoyed music and the kind of ritual year, at least in England, um, and had some sort of more authentic, deeper connection to the soil, to 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 myth and um, spirituality, if you like. And and you can hear me kind of in that sense talking about you know, alluding to blood and soil, right? There's a sense that these are the kind of the inhabitants of the land, the true inhabitants of the land. Um, and I suppose what you what you get is during um, periods of or the period of kind of industrialization and, and um, the kind of apex of empire at the turn of the century with new forms of popular culture emerging. There's a real anxiety that um, this kind of intimate connection to the land is being lost, and um, forms of popular culture are driving that process of loss. So, uh, among certain, and they're often leftists, although it's very easy now to read them back as conservatives. Um, but at the time, radical leftists were interested in preserving that past um, and in, in, you know, creating barriers and, and buttresses against what was felt to be a kind of overwhelming deluge or you know of modernity that was pushing culture ever further away from that. So in that sense, yeah, it, it is an imaginative um, force, and it comes into being as part of modernity. And even you could argue that someone like Bruno Latour might. Um, you know, be a good point of contact here to, to look to that in some ways this is about imaginations of modernity that we have never truly been modern he would say but what we've done is we've imagined that there was a modern period which then implies that there was a kind of pre-modern period um, but in truth uh, this process is a lot more fluid and there aren't these kind of grad- these, these um, kind of dramatic breaks that we tend to think of in terms of being modern and not what's interesting is obviously that's a very temporal conception of modernity but then the collectors that you kind of survey and that you talk about you know obviously the collection that they're doing is often from people who are existing at the same time as them but who exist in this imagined past in this pre pre pre-modern past which immediately calls into question any kind of neat periodization or any kind of coherent um notion of modernity um and that was something i found really fascinating and obviously the social sharps um work in somerset is is quite um significant there i wondered if you could talk about that relationship to people existing at the same time as them but apparently in the past yeah that's an excellent point um you've picked up on the fact that this is an important facet of the kind of 
broader enlightenment um, project, if you like, what you get is, and this is dealt with in the history of anthropology, for example, um, an imagination that people living in, you know, colonies and, and, and exotic places outside of Western Europe, that they were somehow existing on a different kind of temporal plane, that they were almost like fossils, that they were preserved or were living fossils. And, um, so in other words, you know, anthropologists were interested in, in traveling to find a temporal, they were tra- traveling geographically to find a kind of temporal depth. In other words, you, you, can, can, you get a conflation of geographical distance and temporal distance. Um, this is all part of the broader discourse of primitivism. And what you find with Cecil Sharp and with um, other kinds of folk collectors is that um, that process, and this is particular to Sharp, I think, in some ways, that you, he, he goes looking for those kind of internal, um, in, especially in England, those internal kind of primitives uh, that are existing um, in places like Somerset, in, in the kind of rural places um, that are not not the city. And um, you get the same sense that he's looking at a kind of geographical distance, but at the same time, like you say, uh, translating that into a kind of um, temporal difference. So at the time, uh, other people, this was, a, again, a, big, a bigger kind of debate happening about um, folk folklore and what it was. And uh, other opinions would say, for example, these were survivals. And again, it refers back to that idea of what's that, living fossils, that there were survivals of pagan times or you know, um, pre-modern rituals or ways of being that were were surviving but precariously into the modern world. And so therefore, it, you know, what we've just talked about in the first kind of discussion we had um, about the necessity um, uh, of trying to rescue and preserve those survivals because they were at risk of um, kind of disappearing, or at least if they didn't disappear, their meaning would be lost. Um, and that was something important that folklorists at the time thought um, they should, that was their job, their role to safeguard those traditions. You focus on the period kind of 1890 to 1910. And obviously before that, the, you know, we're already seeing industrialization and, and huge shifts. What, what is it in particular about this this specific period that throws up these sorts of anxieties and these um, these impulses, I guess? Yeah, there's something particular. Um, the main answer to that question would be that there's a kind of a real distinctive shift in, in popular culture at that time. Um, but we could read it two ways. One, uh, the symptom is that you get um, the foundation of certain societies. So the folk music, sorry, folk song society gets founded around that time, um, just a bit after the folklore society is founded. So there's a, a period in the, in the late um, 19th century where um, people get interested on a very public level about the disappearance of folk culture. And it's not a coincidence that this happens at the very moment that um kind of forms of mass culture are proliferating on a, on, a, on a larger scale than ever before. So you've got, for example, the expansion of the music hall around that time. You've got um, popular press. You've got lots of other forms of kind of what they would have seen as perhaps lowbrow mass entertainment. Um, and the anxiety amongst the folklorists was, of course, that these new forms of culture were, were, were displacing, if you like, um, other forms of culture that were more interesting and in some ways more intimately connected with the life of the land and the life of the nation. Um, so yeah, again, you've got a sense that there's something going on in terms of um, national identity and being lost when these forms of popular culture take over. And this is, I think, again, a similar a light motif, if you like, in, in folkloric discourse. You tend to find this cropping up whenever there's a revival or an interest in folk culture. Um, that relationship between different or new kinds of popular culture and a force, um, or an imaginative force, to try and resist that change. And and so the the force to try and resist that change in this instance is obviously takes the form of collecting, but a it's a very specific and highly partial kind of collection, right? It doesn't seem to be at all the, the kind of the kind of collection pursued by Cecil Sharp and others isn't at all interested in exhaustive documentation, and it's spe- especially not interested in the individuals who produce these songs, right? Um, so I wondered if you could talk particularly about this ideology ideology of collection and also the role that kind of then new technologies of documentation and reproduction play in their in their work. One of the most interesting things I did when researching the book was to go to. Cecil Sharp's archives, um, which are held in, in Clare College in Cambridge, where I was working at the time. And yeah, his, his books are fascinating because he does, you know, as, as a, in some ways a good anthropologist, he does note down who he took the song from, where it was taken down, and he you know, takes the song in, you know, and transcribes it. And he has a separate book of kind of, of lyrics and, and other things, scribblings. But one of the striking things you find in 
those books is in in a kind of dramatic script he will write not a not a folk song of course across certain of the songs which which begs the question why did he collect them so what i find interesting about sharp is that he has there are kind of two processes going along one is this attempt to kind of collect everything and, and notate things and the other is like you say very selective he knows instinctively it seems what what a folk song is and what a folk song is not um and and that drives his kind of ideological project my point in the book is that um these are not kind of coincidences that uh, he is driven, and, and this is specific to him, and, and we'll talk about other collectors in a minute perhaps, but that he was driven ideologically by um, new kinds of scientific thinking that he was, um, he studied at Cambridge and he was, uh, he was exposed to at the time. This idea that you would take your data and try to make sense of that and create general theories out of specific instances. So, he is um, interested in evolutionary theory. I mean, so is so, so someone like Parry, but Sharp is interested in, in a different way. He's interested in the sense that these songs are um, indicative of the cultures and the race, uh, the people um, that produce them. And this kind of scientific imaginary that Sharp has, and it's, it's quite an unusual one, is one that drives him to do certain things with the songs. And in some ways it drives him further and further away from the kind of anthropology, the, the, the ethnographic work that he was undertaking towards grand kind of theories about where music comes from, about the evolution of culture. Um, so, yeah, the point that I was trying to make is that we need to see him in context as someone interested in scientific thinking, but that that scientific thinking leads him further and further astray from the kind of realities of popular culture at the time. He writes very clearly that he uh, does not like popular culture. He hates the musical. He hates the fact that these songs are being sung in, in taverns, in towns and villages, and, and that other kind of songs are being lost. So again, we get that sense that his collecting is trying to kind of preserve a lost world in the face of changes in popular culture. Yeah, and, and this kind of taxonomic uh, view he takes of, of folk song and I guess scientific and also kind of brackets race scientific approach he takes. Obviously, Cecil Sharp is probably the most famous um, person in the kind of popular imaginary of folk song nowadays and in, in, in some senses is kind of one out there but it wasn't without controversy even at the time right so I wondered if you could talk a bit about other figures who pushed back a bit against that or had other ideas of how to collect um, folk music Absolutely yeah. there were people at the time um, doing similar work much before Sharp um, Lucy Broadwood was a great example um, there were in fact a couple of pioneering women Kate Lee another one who was instrumental in founding the Folk Song Society, who were doing um, what would, we would call field, field work now. Um, uh, Lucy um, Broadwood was more interested in digging up kind of old written sources. She was very open to the fact that what we what people thought of as folk song was actually just really old music. It was um, old ballads and broadsides that people had remembered or been passed down amongst you know families or remembered or misremembered. And she was pointing out the fact that actually, if you look at kind of music and, and words that were being sung in some places at the time, you could correlate them quite closely with with printed material that you'd found, um, you know, a hundred years before. Um, Sharp was not interested in that at all. Uh, he had a very different, and this is what I was alluding to before, a, a more scientific um, obsession with understanding music, and he was not interested at all in in, in the historical work that was required really to understand what this song culture was. My, my broader point in the book is really that, um, you know, folk music is a, is a kind of, a, you know, is an invention. This is not a, a radical point if you read the material closely because um, what you've got essentially is, you know, a series of um, contexts where people are singing old music and at some point that old music gets, or well, facets of that old music culture get turned into folk song. But of course, if you look at the time, people were singing all manner of stuff. You know, there are, it's a, a kind of mistaken belief to think that there were some people singing pure things and other people singing impure things. In truth, like if you look at the South in, in the US at a similar time, there's all kinds of hybridities going on. Um, someone like Henry Burstow is a great example of someone that sang all kinds of material. He just liked singing songs. Some of them were old songs, some of them were new songs. He didn't tend to make, we well, didn't in fact make those distinctions that someone like Sharp and Broadwood uh, the intellectual um, elite, kind of urban elite, would make. They came in and really imposed their view of what was worth collecting and what was worth forgetting onto that uh, song culture. In other words, making a kind of fundamental mistake not to see 
those people or take those people's experiences on their own terms. Yeah, and I, I was going to mention this later, but I think I feel like it makes sense now. In the in the British context, it feels like a lot of the desire for preservation is shot through with anxieties about kind of cosmopolitanism brought about through imperial strength, interestingly, which feels like quite a... a a knotty point, you know, it's through the fact of British imperial dominance that makes concerns about the imperial core m- more profound. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, absolutely. You get some interesting discussion happening where, um, you know, as usual, everyone, you know, people will disagree and, and you find dissenting viewpoints. So uh, Sharp was became famous by debating people in, um, in print at the time and, um, you get the sense that people had read what he had written and said, well, actually, no, this is, if you look closely, you can find songs that come from the continent. And uh, for example, uh, that we can't make these kind of national classifications that he's trying to do about where music comes from and who music belongs to. Um, music is fluid and hybrid. And in some ways, whenever you think of national music, it's a deliberate project of kind of putting up barriers where those barriers, in fact, don't exist. Um, and similarly with, with, the, with the empire that I came across some interesting um, sources where the point was being made that it's impossible to think of Britain at the, at the time as, as being a kind of standalone nation, right? That the imperial project was a, a necessary project of hybridity. Um, so to try and kind of counter that becomes a political project to try and purify and remove those kind of um, uh, those connections that happen organically and inevitably when uh, processes of colonialism bring other cultures into contact with with um, the metropolis. So Sharp, for example, is 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 very um, worried about cosmopolitanism. Cosmopolitan, sorry, cosmopolitanism. And uh, his project is one of trying to resist that. And we can, of course, you know, get a sense that what's going on here is yes, it's political and has a racial dimension. And so, I mean, you already touched on the Folk Song Society a bit. I wondered if you could give a bit more, um, explain a bit more about what this organisation did and how their specific approach to revivalism was also really intimately connected to the movement for social reform. Yeah, well, in fact, the the Folk Song Society was not really interested in in revivalism initially. Uh, It's the point in the book um, is that revivalism really begins with Sharp and, and takes on a new life with Sharp, that he was first and foremost a revivalist. He was not someone that was interested in documenting culture for its own sake. Um, he was interested in reviving it precisely because he thought contemporary society was decadent and, and, and full of kind of bad things. And it was time to return you know, us to the soil and, and the land. So the Folk Song Society was started um, as you know, uh, an endeavour, a London-based metropolitan elite endeavour um, to uh, document and understand kind of what they would have thought of as kind of charming traditions of of song on the periphery, on the margins. Um, so to document those songs, to understand how old they were, um, why they were being sung, and, and to kind of, if they, they published journals, a journal, and, and to document them, to write them down, they, I mean, they were interested in, in revivalism to one extent, which is that these songs would be performed at the meetings, um, but not by the singers themselves. They would be kind of performed by members of the society. Um, so it's worth yeah, seeing, seeing the Folk Song Project in context that what happens is um, a desire for um, collection and for preservation that gets turned into a desire for revivalism under Sharp. One of the most interesting documents and you can find this; it's readily available if you if you look for it. Um, Hubert Parry was uh, asked to give an inaugural address to the society, and his address is a, is a really remarkable text in the history of popular culture because he comes out almost immediately and says, "You know, the society is doing something great precisely because it's combating this kind of horrific um, disease that is popular culture." And uh, on first reading, like I said, it's very easy to see that or to think that this is a kind of uh, a conservative desire to, uh, you know, kind of uh, in some ways, you know, ignore and discount the, the culture of the masses of the people. But Harry, uh, and this, uh, this is not, um, he wasn't alone in thinking this, there was, there was applause and, and there was a lot of praise for this kind of comparison that this um, address that he gave in, in the press at the time. Um, he was comparing it to things like, 
where he wasn't really interested in the popular as such, but what he was interested in was in the intersections of popular culture and, and commerce. So he was a follower of William Morris, um, you know, and so you get a sense that what he's really concerned with is not so much you know, bad popular culture, but it is a kind of system and a system that is disenfranchising people, is selling people bad um, bad stuff in the same way that you might be, as, as a poor person in London, be forced to live in a, in a badly constructed house. Um, he was worried that people were being given kind of junk music and that that was the fault of a kind of rampant capitalist system. So in, that, in other words, what, what we can move towards is a sense that actually this was a leftist anxiety at the time, um, that people were being deprived of good culture um, through and as a result of kind of rampant and immoral kinds of capitalism. And this is kind of like a proto Frankfurt school in some ways um, exactly, yeah. angle. Yeah, I know that's super interesting. And and the the intimacy between kind of social critiques and economic critiques and then um, the role that culture plays is, is really interesting. And I think a word that kept or a phrase that kept coming back to me was the notion of culture war throughout, you know, a kind of Victorian culture war. And the Victorian aspect here, I, I thought, it w- was significant because I think a lot of the discussion of the, the music hall, as much as it being... Uh, that leftist kind of culture industry critique does have a kind of moral core to it, I think. And so it felt quite distinctively Victorian. It, this is a bit outside of what you cover in the book, but I wondered if there are equivalent movements and attitudes um, towards folk music going on, say, in France at the same time or elsewhere in Europe. Yeah, it's a question that I would not be best placed to answer, but I know that so drawing on something like Catherine Ellis's work um, in Fra- on France, that folk music was considered to be a kind of emblem of, of national identity, um, precisely because of its kind of relationship to the soil and, and kind of the, the humble and sim- the kind of honest simplicity of it. Um, but yeah, I would have to direct you to, to other work. I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't want to speak on uh, subjects that I hadn't done no kind of <laughs> necessary work on. Sorry, that was a bit of a curveball. It's just, it's just something that popped into my head. Um, and so then you, you touched on on William Morris there, and then in chapter three you kind of dig into his his relationship to the folkloric imagination a bit more substantially. And I think something that comes through there is the idea that notions of the folk and the pastoral are always at least as concerned with a critique of the present and a vision of the future than a you know a real historical interest in the past. So how does this come through in William Morris's kind of utopian and pastoral vision of socialism? It's um... Yeah, really important to, to see, and it's something that hasn't been done, I don't think, enough in the literature, to see the folkloric kind of drive as being something that's manifest across culture. So it's not just that there were a bunch of, you know, people, folklorists interested in preserving song, and actually the rest of culture was pretty much uninterested in that. Um, that chapter, chapter three, I, I was trying to make the case that this kind of thinking is a, a really indicative of modernity and it's, and it's shared across a kind of broad swathes of, of 19th century and turn of the century thought. Um, and a good way into that is through William Morris, someone who is um, very concerned with, again, a similar kinds of loss, you know, the, the crafts are being lost and that the answer is to revive the crafts, to learn them again, and that in learning them again, this has some deep and important connection to modes of social organization. The crafts are not just crafts, you know, to be practiced by the minority, but somehow by practicing crafts on a mass scale amongst the people, this will return them to a better sense of who they are, um, a better relationship with economics and all this kind of thing. So for Morris, there's that sense that um, the folk and this imagined kind of past where people lived in, in harmony, um, this, this mythic past, that this for Morris, um, is a really important tool for the kind of realization, a uh, utopian realization of the future. Um, so in, in News From Nowhere, he sketches out this past that is very folkloric, um, that involves, um, it, and he doesn't mention song that much, but in, in other, his other writings, he does he does make a very clear case that he's interested in precisely the same kinds of music as, say, someone like Sharp and the folk revivalists were interested in. Um, and he sees this kind of world as being um, so alluring that how could you not, having seen it, then want to bring it into being? And for him, that is the kind of key to the utopian project, having seen the beauty of kind of rural England in its true state of harmony. Um, that is the impetus to creating and resisting, of course, resisting the present and creating a better future. Yeah, and I think it's it's a, a really important distinction in, in, in that Morris's 
uh, and you talk about this in the end of that chapter, right, about the the two the Janus face nature of nostalgia and utopia in, in this sense, which is very distinct from a kind of um, reactionary revanchism expressed through a relationship to the folk. Um, and I, I found that really interesting. And I wondered if you could talk about how Morris and then also you bring in John Ruskin. Specifically, they talk they have a critique of labour and kind of in alienation under industrial capitalism, which I found was really, really fascinating. I wonder if you could talk about that a bit. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, a discourse whereby, and this, this relates precisely back to Parry that we were just talking about, that songs made communally, and this resonates across the Atlantic with with scholars who were writing uh, at Harvard um, around the 10th century, um, songs made communally or crafted uh, among kind of rural communities or communities away, autonomous communities, if you like, um, these were a bit like a chair, better crafted and more honest and authentic objects. I mean, at some point... Um, at the end of the book, Morris talks about his utopians kind of drinking from uh, glassware that's not pure and not perfect, but is impure and, and made you know more beautiful by the fact that it is impure and, and, and kind of obviously handmade. Um, so there's the sense that, that that songs, that an equivalent thing is happening in culture, in expressive culture, that um, kind of good songs, honest songs made by people, individuals are better than mass-produced songs made by, you know, Tim Pan Alley, as it would become known, um, the sheet music industry, the, the music hall industry, these kind of top-down, highly capitalized kind of industries um, were producing mass culture, you know, things that were like the glassware, identical, uniform, in some ways robbing people of that, not only the enjoyment of kind of what they would have thought of as an authentic song, but the, the actual practice of creating those songs themselves. So... I think that's that's the kind of nexus. That's what we're talking about in terms of alienation and music. There, that in terms of the production of song, there's um, a kind of distinct 19th century imaginary where it moves, or it is seen to move from a state of kind of innocence where songs are created um, outside of the metropolis and outside of the capitalist system, towards um, songs being kind of funneled down from um, on high from the city, um, and and therefore some people losing that or being alienated from the practice of creation um, and the practice of kind of communal enjoyment of, of a thing outside of um, a highly um, kind of rationalized system. And I think it, it's really interesting reading that chapter. You can draw such a clear through line from that and through to kind of discourses of rockism and authenticity in rock and pop music. And um, I guess also the way those become masculinized and, and feminized as well, um, quite clearly, which is which is really interesting. And then in chapter four, you, you move across the Atlantic to look at approaches taken to song collecting in the US. Uh, could you explain a bit how figures like John Lomax used folk music as a cultural medium to reassert a belief in absolute racial difference? Yeah, it's a big, big topic there. And uh, yeah, so maybe it's worth just taking a step back and um, looking at Lomax's or thinking about Lomax's earlier work, that he was um, one of these people, just like we've been talking about, who saw um, kind of commonly made or, or marginally made, if you like, um, song as being much preferable to mass pop culture. So one of the first instances, and he was part of, he, he was trained in the kind of Harvard ballad school tradition, even though he was a, a Texan. And uh, so that's the tradition that goes from, from um, Francis James Child through his students and ends up with Lomax. So Lomax goes and tries to find what he thought of as contemporary manifestations of these old ballads, you know, still being made, you know, the kind of last remnants of the peasantry, as, as Sharp would have, would have put it. And Lomax finds them amongst cowboys. Well, he thinks he finds them amongst cowboys. You know, cowboys for him are, and this is where the gender aspect becomes very obvious, that he, he sees the kind of last remnants of an authentic popular culture being amongst the kind of solitary men on the plains. Um, and of course, that implies or it's part of a discourse that feminizes popular culture, that popular culture is a kind of a, a horribly decadent and effeminate thing that is, you know, driving out the true authentic masculine. And, and here, of course, you know, in that sketch, you can hear uh, very clear parallels with, with the kind of old right and the post old right discourse of, of culture that's happening at the moment. So Lomax is part of this tradition that looks to the margins for kind of cultural renewal, which is a, a folkloric trope. And part of that 
Um, I think what we have to do is see his interest in race as being a fundamentally part of that. He's not necessarily interested in African American culture per se. You know, this is where he really is different from Du Bois, for example, and and, and collectors, uh, or African American collectors who are interested in. in African-American culture. He's interested in figures that have been insulated from popular culture, from mass mediated popular culture. And one of the other instances then he finds, he, he starts looking in prisons and he starts looking in the segregated prisons of the South. Um, for him, this is a way, according to his kind of ballad theories, of finding primitive people that have not listened to the radio, not listened to records. And thus he talks about being thrown back on the kind of primitive instincts of the race. I mean, there's a whole bunch of problematic stuff that we, you know that underlies that in terms of imagining African Americans as being primitive and imagining, for example, that prison inmates have been insulated from popular culture. They weren't. They were people who had lived in the world, who had heard music, and had brought that music uh, to the prisons. They, they didn't spend their whole lives in the prisons. The prisons weren't entirely insulated from popular culture, and so on. In any case. Lomax finds himself in the prisons and he records prisoners precisely because he feels they are giving him some deep, profound insight into human music making at its most primitive, at its most basic, at its least um, commercialized, if you like. And that's the slight, the, the kind of, the, the, the elements of positive, if you can try and take something out of it, the, the positive element that he's driven by. But of course, what it, what it ends up doing, as I argue in the book, is, is investing in a very... Um, you know, uncomfortable kind of racial division and um, refusing to kind of take African Americans' culture on their own terms and to understand that culture on its own terms. He documents that culture according to what he feels are the kind of problems of the age. And uh, what he does is inscribe through his fieldwork a particular kind of um, racialized music making, um, which gets taken up and, and, and then, of course, institutionalized his work gets canonized and it's now in the library of congress so it's yeah it, he, he contributes to a very important but quite uh, uncomfortable um, folkloric imaginary where racial segregation is kind of central and uh, m- racial marginality on the part of african americans is central to that authenticity yeah and you use a phrase that you draw from roland Barthes to describe john lomax's practice as an attempt to transform history into nature which i, I thought was really re- a really nice way of putting it i wondered if you could unpack that a little bit yeah, that's from um, mythologies. You know, Bart's really seminal text. You know, one of the earliest um, kind of serious texts on popular culture, on, on trying to understand popular culture semiotically. It's from the last and longest uh, chapter of that book, and it's something that has I, I read it quite early on in the PhD, and it had a profound influence on the way that I thought about uh, things. And I think it's a precise, it's, it's precisely useful in this context in understanding what is happening um, with kind of collecting from um, racial minorities. But what is going on in, in Lomax's project here is an attempt to translate history into nature. So to translate um, a particularly kind of traumatic history of African-American culture through slavery, through the Middle Passage, um, and um, through American history, but to translate that into racial nature. So that on one hand, you have simply and, and dramatically, a history of displaced people and disenfranchisement, slavery. And on the other, you've got a sense in which Lomax is using his work as a folklorist to make this history into a kind of racial nature. This is the essence. This is how African American people are, simply, rather than they are the product of this history. So Bart's work there helps, I think, us to understand the kind of error that's the fundamental error that's at the heart of that kind of folkloric process. It's really remarkable to look at a, a, a country like the US, where and, and particularly the music, right, which is so demonstrably and like self-evidently hybrid, syncretic, impure, or whatever. Um, and you think about you know the history of jazz in particular, which is something I'm interested in, and the fact that so quickly and so sharply. The, this purity can be <laughs> reasserted through through exactly this sort of thing. It's, it's fascinating. So then how does a figure like Du Bois differ then in his treatment of African-American music and its relationship to the folkloric imagination? To me, it seems like a key difference you draw out is the distinction between revival and remembrance, maybe? Yes, absolutely. That's a nice way of putting it. Um, the way they, another way to use it, belonging, that um, Du Bois, as obviously an African-American and someone interested in... 
the future of the race, but not in a, a kind of anxious way, in the same way that, um, say, Parry and Sharp and, and Lomax are. The white, white folklorists tend to be much more anxious about popular culture and, and, and the future. Du Bois is interested in his work in, on one hand, trying to make sense of the trauma of the past, in the sense that this is trying to create a culture out of uh, out of ruins, out of desolation, fragmentation, um, and pain. How do you how do you take that and make a culture out of it that is worth living? That is, you know, that it, on one hand, I'm trying to say this, but it remembers um, that trauma appropriately um, and doesn't bury it. But on the other hand, provides a kind of positive impetus for the future. Provides a reason that the culture would thrive and uh, that there would be a reason um, to kind of instill a sense of belonging and to be optimistic about a future in a country that had historically treated these people with such abhorrent kind of disregard, despite their kind of foundational role in literally you know, building the country. So Du Bois's folkloric work, I mean, he wasn't a collector in the same way that Lomax was, but what he was interested in was... Um, the, the, what he called the sorrow songs, the spirituals. This is the what he saw as the folk music of um, the plantations. And for him, those songs become a kind of beacon, become a way of remembering, but also anticipating a better future. And he uses that material in his book, um, in his writing, to, as a kind of um, a cipher for creating a community, um, a community that, that has a shared sense of identity and that that identity is a positive one rather than one that's simply been imposed uh, as Lomax has done from without. But there's there's not um, there's not complete agreement amongst some of the African-American uh, writers and figures within the, the Harlem Renaissance, for example, that you cover, right? That some of them have a, a much more guarded and sceptical attitude towards popular culture no, oh no, sorry, towards towards the spirituals. Um, is that accurate? I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well notice it's really manifest in something like um, Invisible Man, Ralph Ellison's kind of monumental novel. Ellison is, you know, in that novel points out the fact that there are absolutely, there are, there are kind of fault lines running through African-American communities at the time to do with whether, and this is something that actually Lomax uh, comes across when he, writes to some of the Southern colleges and says, please, can I come and you know, share my research with you? And they say, well, I'm sorry, I think, you know, you've got the wrong end of the stick here. We're not really interested in this kind of primitive stuff in your idea of us as being sort of authentically primitive. Um, so yeah, a, a division between whether we take this, these kind of so-called primitive um, songs, these spirituals and, and the kind of culture that, that gave birth to them. And like Du Bois, we, we, we see it positively as a source of inspiration. Um, or, on the other hand, whether that is actually a, a hindrance, a, you know, a burden and a barrier to creating a truly modern African-American nation, a, a community. So there are debates at the time between what is the right way of doing that. Some colleges um, have certain ideas, other colleges have different ideas. So amongst the Harlem Renaissance, you get a sense that, yeah, that there are positive kind of sources of inspiration that come from the deep folk past, if you like, at the same time as there are um, efforts to try and transcend that by um, entirely jettisoning those kind of, those stereotypes, precisely because the stereotypes seem to hold uh, hold back the kind of progress of that community in relation to the kind of white mainstream. It, it struck me as having parallels actually there with um, different attitudes towards improvisation and improvised music and jazz. So I was thinking about George Lewis's conception of the urological and the Afrological uses of past material there as well. It felt like there was really um, real clear similarities there actually. And so then on chapter five, you kind of turn it back to Cecil Sharp and discusses quite complicated ideological underpinnings, which include a really strong kind of ethno-nationalism, I think, that uh, structured his approach to folk song and what you call his hostility to the present. So I, we, you've already touched on him quite a bit, but I wonder if you could talk really specifically about the kind of broadly proto-fascistic aspects of um, of Cecil Sharp's work. Yeah. I mean, Sharp is, he's had his fair share of criticism over the years. And there's a sense, I think, amongst folklorists, uh, or, you know, contemporary, those scholars interested in folklore that, you know, <laughs> He is a slightly awkward figure, and you know we just need to kind of forget about him. But what had struck me in the literature was that people had, someone like Dave Parker, had, had identified that there was something odd about his politics. There was something kind of contradictory, in the same way that we've been referring to throughout this discussion. That there's 
some sense in which there's a, an, a, an odd overlap between the kind of leftist radicalism and what we read as kind of staunch conservatism, uh, particularly kind of racial con- uh, conservative attitudes towards racial identity and belonging. And But other scholars have just left it there and said, well, this is just how it is. It's an odd, odd kind of mixture. And so I saw that chapter and my work in in general on Sharp as being a, an attempt to make sense of, of his politics. Um, and when you start to piece the you know, the, the puzzle together, um, you see quite clearly that he shares, he anticipates um, uh, particular kinds of fascist ideas. Um, in, in a way that I was drawing a lot on Steve Sternhell's work, um, and he makes the broad but uh, really essential point that, that fascism should not just be seen as in relation to uh, fascist regimes of the 30s and, and 20s, but really in terms of a culture uh, that gets born around the late 19th century and um, is a culture before it becomes a political force. And so Sharp is very much of this culture. He is someone that is uh, a conservative nationalist, um, but he's also a socialist. He's a Fabian socialist, so he's interested in slow social change. He's conservative when it comes to women's rights. He doesn't support um uh, suffrage. He doesn't support universal suffrage, the vote. Um, he's interested in the soil and people's relationship to the land and their past. He's anxious about cosmopolitan culture. And we can hear, you know, pre-echoes of that way in which the word becomes associated with um, Jewish people, with figures who transcend in uncomfortable ways the barriers of nationhood. Um, he's interested in resisting what's happening in terms of the empire and hybridity. He doesn't like that. He wants to rescue kind of essential Englishness. He wants to do this through education. Um, he's not interested in in revolution, he, but he is interested in a kind of revolution of the spirit, and that's Sternhaus' phrase. He's interested in changing, and, and, and he has a kind of, um, as I mentioned, a kind of masculine focus, but changing English men and changing English boys through education to um, have a new attitude towards the nation and their race and their brotherhood. Then if that sounds a bit vague, then we can start being more specific. You know, he uses words like Aryan, um, and he's interested in reading work that's being carried out in France uh, on what was con- what was thought of as a kind of Aryan, the Aryan roots of music. Um, so all this stuff is kind of, they are under the surface in his work, and I felt that it hadn't really been brought to the surface and that, that was, as I said, my I saw that as my job in this chapter. Yeah, and to circle back to the kind of the, the Darwinist and the scientific stuff that you touched on at the at the beginning, he has this idea right of communal selection, which involves. I th- correct me if I'm wrong. You say the kind of a basically an erasure of individual creativity, and something that comes through in the book a few times is your kind of a defence of the notion of authorship to some degree because of the problematic implications of this. And this is kind of a slightly uncomfortable realisation for me because I'm instinctively quite sceptical of claims of individual genius or intellectual property or whatever. But then the fascistic or maybe social Darwinist overtones of the idea of folk songs being turned into what you call anonymous tokens of organic collectivity really gave me pause. So I, I wonder if you could unpack that a bit and whether there's a way to kind of square that circle between not lauding the individual, but also not kind of dissolving into this kind of scary collective volkish idea. Yeah, absolutely. In some ways, I was interested in understanding or bringing individuals back into the picture uh, precisely because of this sense that we have that folk songs emerge naturally, organically amongst the people from some anonymous place. Um, I mean, as I said, there's, there's, there's so many ironies here that Sharp does give credit to individual people in his field work. And then when it comes to theorizing about it, he suddenly forgets that. And he's much more interested in theorizing how these songs came about and why they came about. And essentially his, his whole theoretical edifice rests on this idea that the songs are organic manifestations of the race and of the people that live in that location. And in order for that to work, he has to really get rid of individual authorship to make sense of it. And what he does is to, um, to see songs as being, and th- th- there's all kinds of problems here, and people identified these at the time. Um, his, his, um, you know, his colleagues in the Folk Song Society and other people uh, writing in in journals at the time reviewed his book and were very sceptical of his theory um, because he seemed to change his theory according to who he was debating and, and what he was writing about, and it didn't really seem like a watertight theory. Um, 
in any case, what he was trying to do was get a sense of these songs kind of emerging from the soil. And therefore, as a revivalist, what we need to do is get back to those songs and those songs will help us get in touch with our roots. Um, that's the kind of theory. Of course, as, as we're talking about, the practice is very different. That These songs, um, we're not talking about individual geniuses, but we're talking about at least kind of creativity that is not being given due credit in the folkloric discourse. Um, what you find in, in the US is a similar idea that somehow songs are created through um, this is the communal theory of balladry. Uh, it was rubbish by a brilliant writer called Louise Pound, um, who was one of the kind of key, or, or took aim at Lomax's work. And her argument was that we should not just assume that these ballads emerged organically from some dancing throng in the past, but that we, our job as historians is to understand where they came from and that there, there, there are authors. Um, and so it would make sense um, to, to, to dig up this history and to put authorship back um, in place. So to return to your question, I think it's um, it's just an important thing in, in, in talking about folk songs to make sure that we understand that they are authored. I mean, they might be authored and reauthored, and, and, and as people pass them around, they are kind of rewritten and, and therefore authorship uh, to some extent is communal. But that it's important to have that sense that there are human agents involved, that it's not just some organic process of emergence from from the soil. One thing that just kind of initially, maybe quite superficially, I found surprising was uh, Sharp, but also people like Hubert Parry and, and others, his assertion of the purity of the folk songs that he collected and, and that they were folk songs by dint of their purity and obviously especially considered against the music hall or whatever. But that felt so surprising to me that given what I know of the folk canon growing up, right, is that it's full of drinking songs and murder ballads and tales of infidelity and incest and all sorts of generally very grim goings on. So for me, that's that's the folk canon. And maybe that's because of, you know, changes since since Cecil Sharp. But it just felt it felt like a really interesting contrast to the kind of folk music that I know. So Sharp, yeah, Sharp is interested in um, cleaning up you know, folk culture and passing on because of this political project. And this is where it's important to situate him as a kind of political agent in that sense. Um, not just, or, or a gatekeeper, if you like. He's not just interested in documenting a culture and documenting these odd things that people sang in the past, but in creating and curating a kind of canon that would be uh, appropriate for school children to sing. And not just in the sense that we need to clear this up because, you know, there are some things that children shouldn't be exposed to, but more that that he didn't, he wanted to create through this work a new kind of person and that the folk music was the tool to do that. It was a classic kind of instrumentalized music. Um, but as you say, what we, what we need to do to kind of understand the past in a <clears throat> more accurate way would be to remove that idea of folk music and just see the, the songs of the past. And this is what people are doing now uh, who work on this area. Um, we just look to the past and, and we understand it as being uh, you know, a vernacular culture, um, uh, you know, a popular culture that people did sing songs, all kinds of things. Sometimes they were about, you know, the kind of things that Sharp was interested in, bucolic innocence. But like you say, there are plenty of songs that are not about that. And, you know, as with any culture, there are hybridities and there are variations. Um, and it's precisely the extent to which folklorists select one strand of that that becomes the kind of the problem. Yeah, and I suppose the fact that the these less pure and less bucolic tunes have endured maybe gives light to the kind of millenarianism or the, the anxiety about extinction that really seem to motivate a lot of the people that you that you talk about as well, right? Absolutely, yeah. There's fundamentally a sense that um, the folkloric anxiety um, does not, uh, is not really worth um, worrying about too much. That In some senses, the anxiety is always there, ever-present, and an answer to that, to that anxiety is to stop worrying about culture. I mean, it's not the answer to everything, but I think folklorists have historically tended to overplay that anxiety and that there has always been, you know, for example, you know, vernacular music making has not stopped, people have not stopped writing songs that um, popular culture, you know, in the kind of mass Frankfurt school sense has not demolished entirely um, our intimate everyday enjoyment of music. And I suppose that makes me wonder, and this is something that kept coming to my mind reading the book, is it possible to have a kind of preservationist impulse that isn't inherently regressive? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think so. I think the, a, a good model would be the earlier collectors um, before Sharp that um, you know we could go around and we could collect songs 
um, we could, yeah, attempt to understand, say, the ways in which people uh, adopt and adapt the kind of material they come into contact with. And, uh, and then there is some interest in preserving that, but without that sense that what we're doing is um, somehow uh, an important cultural force for rejuvenation at the same time. And then in, in towards the end of the book, you make a strong case for the ease with which the folkloric imagination, as we've spoken about, becomes this central thread in a fascistic relationship to culture. Um, could you talk a bit how it becomes a key component in contemporary far-right kind of conspiratorial culture wars? Yeah, absolutely. So the figure I turned to was Paddy Tarleton, but there are plenty of other figures amongst the kind of dissident uh, rights of the 2010s and and, and now the 2020s who are invested in very similar ideas to the ones that Sharp was encountering um, at the turn of the century. So investing in racial difference, investing in songs um, as being key indicators of kind of racial um, identity, but not only indicators of racial identity, but sources of kind of, like, as I said, rejuvenation. Um, and this is the kind of fascistic, the palingenesis, if you like, the kind of way in which fascism would want to rebirth a culture, um, not through a Marxist up, uprising, but through an, another kind of revolution whereby culture would transform people into new subjects, new political subjects. And, um, and music is amongst the old right, kind of a, a crucial part of this. They have similar anxieties to the leftists of the, of the late 19th century in the sense that they are often, uh, they often have a kind of antipathy towards mass popular culture for the similar reasons. They, they see it as being kind of capitalistic and perhaps, you know, it's, it's gendered as well. So there, is, there are several parallels, as you mentioned, between the discourse of anxiety about popular culture now and the same kind of anxieties that were being thrown around at the turn of the century. Um, but in particular, what's interesting amongst the alt rights is the sense that, um, yeah, folk is the route to reconnecting people with blood and soil, with the land, with one particular kind of people. Um, in other words, that folk culture is a manifestation of um, one particular ethnic group, and that that group, uh, in this case, in the alt right, is or since it is under attack, this this anxiety that white culture, um, the, the very culture that Cecil Sharp was interested in preserving and, and reviving, um, is at this precise moment in time uh, threatened by immigration, threatened by cultural changes, hybridities, these kind of things that are uh, you know well-known aspects of our modern world. This is kind of an aside, but I, I know you've written elsewhere about vaporwave and this internet music, so that sort. And obviously, there's a massive fascist strand that you know, fash wave, and there's a big kind of internet uh, subculture of the far right, and with those sorts of aesthetics, are those? Is it the same far right? Do you think does do it listening to Nazi folk and fash wave, or are, because the relationship to the soil is obviously quite um, attenuated on when it comes to vaporwave and that sort of stuff. Yeah, this is a great question. I mean, as, as with any movement, there are, you know, people who disagree and like different kinds of music. I always think of the extreme right, the relationship between music of the extreme right um, and culture as being almost like a virus, that there's a, a sense in which the extreme right doesn't really have um, a genre that, that uh, is archetypal, but what it does is infiltrate other genres and kind of flip them, turn them into other, into kind of fascist tokens. So it's a great example with Vaporwave. You know, Vaporwave didn't start as a fascist subculture. It has nostalgia as, as part of its kind of DNA. Um, but Fashwave comes in, or, 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 or right, um, dissident right kind of creators come in and, and, and flip it and turn it into something um, kind of fascistic. And, and there's some good arguments to be made about why kind of um, 80s pop might make a good kind of fascist anthem, but that's maybe another conversation for another time. It's the same kind of thing with folk music that, you know, there are these old union songs and what does, what do kind of alt right singers do? They come in and they take these union songs and they flip them and they become alt right anthems instead. Um, so yeah, I don't see there as being a kind of anything essentially, any essential relationship between music and extreme right wing politics, but that there is a kind of strategic or even a tactical 
kind of use of that music. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's true. Right? I was, I found it really interesting. Some of the tunes that you identify Paddy Talton as, as adapting, like Come Out Ye Black and Tans, right? IRA anthems and union yeah. songs, which feels completely counterintuitive. But I guess it just reveals the um, malleability of, of fascist aesthetics. Um, I guess, yeah, I thought that was super interesting. And then given that contemporary context, I wonder where that leaves contemporary left-wing folk groups. Thinking about like on the British and Irish circuit, there's bands like Lankham or Shovel Dance Collective. Is, is there room for them? Can they can they engage in the kind of productive nostalgia or a productive use of the folk canon? Or is it is the, is the game up? <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah. And perhaps I do leave the book on quite a... Quite a dark note. One reviewer mentioned that I, you know, I start the, with a preface about kind of the importance of hope, and we end in, in some ways in quite a hopeless place. But that's not to say that there is no hope. Uh, in fact, if you look to chapter three, that, that there are plenty of arguments in the book for a more positive engagement with folk culture and, and folks, you know, productive relationship with the left, and historically, you know, more I think, um, yeah, kind of underdeveloped in some ways relationship with the left that has not kind of not um what's the best way of putting it come to fruition in the sense that we have it, it's, it's a difficult genre where you've got equal kind of parts left and right and, and it's very difficult to say what, which is more authentic which is more true to the kind of history of folk i suppose in the book what i'm saying by the end is that actually if you take the alt-right on their own terms when they're talking about race music nation um this is a more authentic engagement, if you like, with the history of folklorists' work than the leftist engagement. And in some ways, the leftist problem is to, to downplay all that problematic, uncomfortable stuff about blood and soil and about you know nostalgia and um, regression and all that kind of stuff. So, if there is space, and I think there is definitely space for you know leftist or you know, radical um, uses of folk music, but it would have to be the kind of use that would, you know have a kind of a knowing distance from the history of folklorist work um, and maybe go back and recuperate that sense of a hybrid popular culture that, you know, folk music historically has been obsessed, with, as we've said, with purism, with um, not just ethnic and racial purism, but cultural purism. And then a more authentic kind of leftist uh, political attitude would be encompassing, would be uh, Catholic, uh, would be... Uh, um, much more open to hybrid forms of culture. And, you know, if you're going to be a democratic kind of movement or have a kind of democratic sympathy, you need to take people's experiences seriously on their own terms rather than imposing your idea of what they should be listening to. This, for example, is Ewan McCall's uh, fundamental failing, right? That the, the, the biggest, um, the most famous, perhaps leftist um, Marxist songsmith of the, of the modern era um, is very much in the same line as Sharp, in the sense that he thinks there's something bad about popular culture and the answer is to turn to folk culture and that is where you're going to find true uh, and good culture, rather than saying perhaps there's something about, you know, uh, people's love with pop of popular culture that is worth taking seriously on its own terms. It's kind of like a, a folk without the folklorists, is the word perhaps. Yeah. And what are you working on now? So now, yeah, I'm still thinking about these... Um, similar themes, nostalgia um, and political radicalism. So I've been doing some more work on the um, Nick Fuentes orbit, the, the Groupe Core movement, um, if you like. But also thinking about um, folk music. I'm currently working on a Cambridge companion to folk music and perhaps some more work on Vaporwave. So. Groupe Core sounds <laughs> relentlessly horrible, but in invaluable work as well, I think. <laughs> uh, nice. Well, thanks very much for joining me. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me.